Welcome to the Marketing Stir podcast by Starista, probably the most entertaining marketing podcast you're going to put in your ears. I'm Jared Walls, associate producer and Starista's creative copy manager. The goal of this podcast is to chat with industry leaders to get their take on the current challenges of the market, but also have a little fun along the way. In this episode, Vincent and AJ talked to Nancy Giordano, founder and strategic futurist at Play Big. She spells out what it means to be a strategic futurist, as well as the work that goes into identifying and addressing systemic injustices. She also discusses the power of saying thank you. AJ is a boy genius, and Vincent has his eye on a silver apple. Give it a listen. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It is me, Vincent Petrofessa with Starista, the Vice President of B2B Products and Partnerships. With Starista, that must mean one thing. You're listening or watching The Marketing Stir. So great to be here with you all, as I'm always happy to be here. Starista, first of all, who is Starista, right? This podcast, what was it about? Well, The Marketing Stir, we talk all things marketing. We talk some personal stuff too. We want to find out what people are doing, what they're like, what their daily life is. But Starista, we are an identity marketing company. We have our own data, business to business, business to consumer. We help market to those databases, get you new customers, email marketing. We also have our own DSP that we could send and execute media on called Adster, display, programmatic, OTT. Email me at vincent at starista.com. That is how confident I am that we could help. We have an amazing podcast ahead of us today. But until I get to my guest, my amazing co-host, ladies and gentlemen, you know him. He is the CEO of Starista. He's my quarterback. I'll have to explain what quarterback is to him because he's not a huge football fan. But ladies and gentlemen, Mr. AJ Gupta. What's up, AJ? Hey, Vincent, quite the start to the year here. We were hoping for a less, uh, less enthusiastic start, but here we are. But here we are. Here we are in this year. We are recording this episode around G- uh, January 7th. Yesterday, January 6th, not a great day. Not a great day for the country. Not a great day for Washington, D.C., the capital. But you know, you'll have already known about that. Hopefully it stops there uh, right. by the time this episode comes out. Oh, let's get off of that. Let's get off of better topics, right? <laughs> What's good with you, AJ? How are you doing so far in this new year? I'm doing well. I came back refreshed. Uh, but uh, yeah, this week has gone back by pretty quickly. A lot of activity happening at Starista already, which is always a good thing in spite of everything that's happening in the world. We seem to be quite busy with sales and marketing this year. So, so far, so far, so good. Yeah, no, I agree. I have, I've never been busier in my career. And you know what I know, you know what I learned recently that come April, I have been in this industry for 20 years. I started in April, 2001 at direct media and been in this industry now for 20 years. How is that possible, you ask? I look so young. Thank you, AJ. You didn't say that. That's just in my head. But yeah, 20 years in the industry. I just realized that the other day. I'm I'm glad I'm just 28 still. Yeah, well, you are 28 years old and only in the industry about 10 or 12 years. I feel like I've known (laughs) you for, for, yeah, 28. I started at 10. 10 years old. Boy genius, that one. (laughs) <laughs> I love it. I love it. But yes, and who who knows? I, I love this yeah, industry. Congratulations! Uh, I didn't uh, I didn't realize you were uh, coming up on twenty. You might be eligible for a silver apple very shortly here. Silver apple yeah. awards. Twenty five years in the industry. I was the oldest rising star award winner. Yep. But I hope to be the youngest silver apple award winner. Let's see what the future holds. That's a little hint on this next guest, ladies and gentlemen. I really enjoy talking to this next guest. I'm so glad I've met her. I feel like I've known her a long time. That's a sign of a great guest, ladies and gentlemen. Founder, strategic futurist, we'll get into that. I would love to welcome to the marketing stir, ladies and gentlemen, from Play Big, Nancy Giordano. What's going on, Nancy? 
Hello. You know, I'm describing this year as a dynamic year. I've just decided dynamic kind of like puts it all under that bucket and we can look at it from the negative or the positive. The thing I will say just quickly about January 6th is that it was a day that democracy hopefully stayed intact despite all the disruption. We had a really uh, successful election in Georgia and we, you know, clearly need better security, but democracy yeah. seems to have, you know, uh, prevailed. Prevailed, so, yes. I dynamic. I like that. Dynamic is a great way to, to describe. And hopefully, you know, I, when the, the podcast comes out, every, you know, smoother times, uh, maybe not a smooth transition, who knows, but uh, sm smoother times. But Nancy. Well, like I, you know, that's something, you know, it's funny because I'm a really disruptive person and I want to go and change a whole bunch of things. I talk a lot about disruption and transformation, et cetera, but there are certain things that do hold us safely. And I think knowing that our democracy at its yes. core even with all the debate and even with all the emotion that comes with it still holds like the core tenets of it still hold and that there are processes in place that ensure that these transitions are safe. And so that makes me feel good. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, Nancy, I want to get right into it. I love what you're doing. I, you know, I want to ask you about first your organization. It's not even an organization. I feel like you're the organization. It's you. So could you get, tell us about, you know, First of all, like play big and then yourself. I'd love, just, I'd love to get right into it for the listeners. Well, the way I guess I would describe it is I'm sort of the organization of the future, if you think about it, because I think that we will become increasingly free agents, um, being known for and, and really offering a very particular either skill set or role into this constellation of activities that we're doing. And we're going to work and plug and play with others who are also like that. So the way we describe our teams and the work that we do, so Play Big Inc. is a strategic inspiration company. Like we help organizations and teams and leaders uh, better prepare for what's coming and build strategies that allow them to thrive into the future. But that can really change and vary. We did a project recently uh, with a client where we looked at the future 50 years out. That's wow. kind of maybe think about it. Um, but the point is, how do we do that? And it's because we have this really big uh, ecosystem of players in it that are contributors in one way or another. And so the way we describe it is the future is fluid and so are our teams. So we work in a very fluid, dynamic way that allows us to always be on the front edge of the conversation. And I, can, I think that's what the organization of the future will look like. There will be less this demarcation of being an employee versus not an employee or inside the organization versus outside the organization. It's going to be much more permeable. Nancy, tell us how you kind of, you know, formulated Play Big, your, your, uh, your role as a futurist. How, how did this come about? Was your, what was your background? Well, yeah, what did you study? I grew up in advertising. Well, I studied psychology and economics, and so it's not so surprising that I end up in this place. And I think if I'd known behavioral economics existed back in the day, I would have loved that because I think there was this really a huge interplay between our psychology and sociology and how we make decisions in the market. Uh, but I think that, you know, I, having grown up in really great advertising agencies from Ogilvy Mather and Foot Cone and uh, TBWA, Shy at Day, uh, I was exposed to extraordinary thinkers, got to launch really ma amazing brands. But at some point, you realize that the decision was not going to be around the brand. It was going to be around, again, all the information that was around or the context in which the brand lived and the values that the brand um, made visible in every decision that they made. Uh, as we have more and more choices and more and more ways we were going to get information and as certainly social media and word of mouth became so important there was going to really we were going to be less interested in the brand new us but that we understood the brand and as we really went into that work you realize you have to understand how the shifts are around and so I started building all these synthesized um, maps of understanding of key demographic trends and lifestyle trends and shopping trends and all that stuff to see how things were shifting and when you actually hook all that information together you can see pretty clearly what the future needs and expects of us we often look at this information too discreetly and uh, we don't see how they are connected to one another. So I just um, you know, became known for that way of thinking and uh, it sort of evolved then less into marketing and more into this idea of innovation and strategic development and really getting deeper into organizations in which they are thinking about their purpose and um, you know, they're, 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 they're some of the big uh, questions that they're asking as they go into the, uh, uh, this fast moving future, right? So we work with Coca-Cola, we work with Brinker, we work with Nestle, we work with, um, but their project was Sprint. Like we did some really great projects with really great brands, but then you hit the next hurdle, which is because things are changing so quickly and there's so much information that is making, uh, that we have to learn and get better familiar with. What you found is that the organizations that were not able to absorb and respond to new information really got stuck. Um, and we could fly it in with a big golden bow and you know, a big plane, a big red bow and all that. And they still wouldn't believe that these things were happening around them. 
And I found that really, really frustrating. So at some point I jumped over into the land of tech and helped start an artificial intelligence company, built a conference on the seven most disruptive technologies, really immersed myself. And what I realized is how unprepared we all are for how fast things are going to change and how dramatically they are going to change. So I've really been on a mission now. And that's my strategic futurist, right? I don't have a crystal ball as much as I have a way of being able to navigate through complexity and ambiguity that I think uh, would help us all um, approach so much change with more confidence. And so you have a great presence online as well as kind of in the conference uh, circuit with being a keynote speaker. Uh, so how do you go about building that uh, presence and how, what do you recommend to kind of the CEOs and executives uh, listening to the podcast and how they could build their own personas online? Yes, yeah, interesting because I haven't really actively thought, you know, built it with that kind of um, intention as much as it is when we made a really decision early on that we are less hunters than we are beacons like i want to be a lighthouse for people who are looking for this information so how do i become a credible and trusted and inspiring lighthouse for the kind of thinking that we have and so really our marketing if you will is uh, very much focused on being of utility it is about being able to offer content, it's being able to offer thought leadership, it's being able to offer presence, it's being able to donate time to places where it thinks it makes sense. It's really investing in those relationships that I think are so important for us to be able to be credible sources for this, because I think that's one of the really key parts is that we often think that the relationship building is ancillary and when we've got time, and I would argue that it is actually a really critical business function now is that we have those kinds of places and people that we can learn with. And so I think it has been more organic than it has been, again, intentional, but it was very strategic in the sense that we knew we wanted to be a credible lighthouse for information. We want people to find us. You know, we're really seeking this kind of insight. Where how, would, how, how can you find us? Right. Oh, that's, that's awesome. That's the best way to do it organically for sure. Well, because we talked a lot about early on that we are, you know, our mission is that we really help visionary leaders um, make a, you know, play bigger. And so this idea of why visionary leaders, because people who are already leaning into the future, it's really hard to get people who haven't woken up at all to this to pay attention. Um, and a lot of energy was spent there early on in a pretty ineffective way. And that got frustrating. So I was like, the minute someone's perked up and curious about where it is, we want to be right there to help them. Uh, but there is something about already leaning in, and which is why then I'm so focused right now about how do we cultivate more visionary leaders, right? right? What does it mean to be visionary? And what is it about that that is so important in being able to move forward? And I would argue one of the key tenets is curiosity. How do we ensure that we are really cultivating and incentivizing curiosity internally and, and externally inside our organizations? Because I think that it's vital to be able to see what is coming around next and being open to it and experimenting with it. And probably no other year other than 2020 was as important for visionary leadership for a lot of companies to even survive through the pandemic. So what are some of the important lessons that have come out of this pandemic uh, that you have seen? Well, I think it's twofold, right? I think that to your point, 2020 opened our eyes and really woke us up to so many things. And I think 2021 then puts us in a position to act on that. So I think that those are both, they're both really pivotal years. Uh, for 2020, I do think that what we found is, you know, probably four key things, if not five, that we really should be paying attention to. And the first is that, you know, um, becoming more reliant on digital technologies doesn't have to be as scary as we all thought it was. We all had to jump in and do it en masse. One of my, you know, someone asked me what the key headline was for 2020. And for me, it was a news story from the New York Times that they had to move 1.1 million school children into remote learning within a couple of weeks. And this is a school district that doesn't have like, all the iPads and all the ed techs and all the families who already know how to use all the apps, right? So there's a huge gap already in, in technology and understanding and they had to do that so quickly. So that became you know, reverberated across every organization that had put all those hurdles in place about why it was too difficult or too expensive or too disruptive to ever try anything like Zoom meetings and cloud computing and suddenly like, boom, here we are. So the fact that we've moved into everything from telemedicine to remote learning to hopefully someday e-voting to certainly e-commerce uh, has been one of the big, really big shifts. And so hopefully that gives us confidence to try new things moving forward because we're going to have VR and AR that are going to impact our work. We're going to have, you know, again, more data and artificial intelligence that's going to give us different insights around things. So hopefully this first this year or this past year um, has primed us to be more confident moving into that. Um, the second was our relationship with the planet and sustainability, because I do think that we saw our, like when everything stopped, and there's a great headline from The Economist that showed the planet with a big closed sign on it, 
Uh, so when you're no manufacturing, no driving, no malls, no movie theaters, no anything, no restaurants, everything shut down, it was devastating economically, but the planet did get to take a healthy breath. And we got to see what that looked like when the skies cleared and the waters cleared and the carbon levels went down a little bit. And so, and we also saw the areas that had more air pollution were more vulnerable to the virus and to the respiratory effects of it. So I think we've become hopefully more respectful of our relationship with the planet and we can move forward now in a way that's more harmonious between economic vitality and environmental stability and health. Like I think that hopefully we'll be paying much more attention to that. Um, I think that the, um, you know, the third is really this idea, of, I mean, well, certainly it became very clear around systemic bias and injustice, and we became much more aware of the fact that we were all in the same storm, but we're not on the same size boat. And I think that analogy really helped me become more sensitive to the fact that we are seeing um, the gaps that we need to address. We always knew that there was this growing inequality in all these different ranges from healthcare to education to income to et cetera, but it became very, very visible. Um, and part of what we were just describing here, the early portion of the year about the frustration that that is creating inside our, uh, not just our economy, but our society is something that we need to really get much clearer on. Um, and hopefully, and recognize that it's not just a moment in time, that it wasn't just an economic fallout because of the, the pandemic, that there is actually long sustaining uh, systemic bias that needs to be addressed both, you know, um, from an uh, ethnic and a racial perspective, but also from a gender perspective and certainly from a class perspective. So we got to work hard, you know, really get our arms around that moving into the future. Um, and then the last, I think we learned a lot about our own resilience and who's got our back inside our families, inside our employers, the brands that we do business with, you know, really who had our back and who didn't. Um, who can we trust inside our government, inside, again, all these other entities. And so it's not just our personal resilience, which has been strengthened um, and certainly tested and hopefully supported, but we're really looking around at who, has, who can we trust and who can we rely on moving forward. And I think we're going to become much more discerning and savvy about that. And this then leads into the conversation about data that I hope we get to have in a few minutes, because I think that becomes a really important part of building this trusted relationship with each other moving ahead. Well, yeah, I, you know, I wanted to talk about uh, data, certainly, and we always love data here as a data company. But, you know, before that, I, Nancy, I want to talk about, I, I love your optimism, if I may say that there's optimism uh, in, in what you're saying there, uh, despite a lot of uh, turmoil, if you will, going on in, in the world. But, are, you know, can you give us a little, just some tidbits about some 2021 future optimism uh, in the industry that you see kind of moving forward coming out of this? Yeah, well, I, what I think, again, is because so many of the, you know, long-standing practices have been shaken to its core, we get to rebuild and reinvent and reimagine, rethink how we want so many of these things to do. Again, higher ed is going through a giant transformation at this moment, right? And we're going to see organization after organization going through the same thing and thinking about that. So I think hopefully now, again, we're more primed, we're more sensitive, we're more confident, we're more curious as we move into this future about what can be. Uh, we created an event on New Year's Day that actually um, your listeners could listen to if they wanted to, but it was really focused on building a better next. That is really the mission and the opportunity and the invitation that we have right now. And what we did is we introduced four ideas that are shaping the future at this moment around better life, better AI, better work, and better humans. Like, how exciting is that? Because I think the key thing right now is to realize it wasn't that we just got through a pandemic and we're going to figure out how to rebuild in 2021. We're standing at the front end of a giant transformation. I would say that if you talk to the technologists and the scientists and the entrepreneurs and the designers who are building the future, which I get to spend a lot of time with, and you ask them how far along we are, they will tell you we're 1%. Right? And so the pandemic may be only 2%, but I would argue it was just deeper adoption of current technologies. It wasn't actually the innovation that's about to happen with all these new things that are going to be coming forward. So the idea that we have this opportunity to rebuild and reshape and rethink everything is extraordinary to me. And it's not an opportunity that we should waste. You know, the old Winston Churchill line, never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, I, break, breakdowns are significant, and I feel a tremendous amount of empathy for people who've had to face certainly illness and death in their family, but also to close a 130-year-old family business or um, personally are trying to figure out how to make ends meet or have to stand in long food lines. Like all that kind of infrastructure that is so broken needs to be addressed. But for those of us who have been healthy enough and safe enough to not be that, we have this responsibility to go build a better next. You know, we have the resources, we've got the brain power, we've got, again, emerging technologies that we need to get more familiar with and we need to build them safely. That's really the key part. It's not just to rush in and start using this, but to really think about the responsibility that these potent technologies put in our laps. So I think it's an extraordinarily interesting and fascinating time to be around. 
No, I, I agree. You know, we talked to some people on the podcast in the travel industry on uh, both personal and business travel here on the marketing stir. And, you know, just saying that out of this, people are going to be like, oh, okay, well, let's not take this for granted. I was maybe going to, I was always putting off that trip. I'm going to take it now because you, you never know when something like that can get taken away from you. I'm going to, I'm going to travel. I was just going to say on New Year's Day, one of the people who joined our event uh, is the CEO of Virtuoso, which is a large independent luxury travel company, Matthew Upchurch. And we had this little conversation afterwards because you never know how much something means to you until it's taken away. And so the pent up demand for those who will be able to afford to do it. And I think we have to, again, remember not everyone's going to have that same opportunity. So I think we have to be thoughtful around that and understanding how do we make things more inclusive, which is why I get excited that we think about virtual reality travel. So there are actually, there are, yes, there are the people who really want to get on the plane and go fly to wherever. But if you look at something like Air Nippon Airways, a &A, they've been experimenting for years with a completely virtual travel with haptic suits and VR and robotics and all kinds of things that make it possible that even if I couldn't afford to fly to Paris, I could still have a trip that sort of, like I could get some understanding of what it is. There's a you know, VR tour of the Coliseum right now. So I think yeah. what's actually really cool is um, there will be the people who will sort of activate it the traditional way and then there'll be more and more thoughtfulness, I think, into how to expand that to everyone. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. You know, I remember my my mother, I always regretted, I wasn't in a financial position to do this, uh, but my mother would have always loved to go to Italy. Right? You know, my ancestors are from Italy. I got a chance to go there later and my mother had passed away. And I always said to myself, I would have loved to have done that, you know, but like something like virtual, I know I may be getting off a little topic here, but it's virtual you know, take her to Italy in that sense, right? Or take someone who can't afford it, or maybe it's been always a dream uh, of someone's to go there and they don't have the means, but I, I love that. I think, means, I think partly there'd be physical limitations, right? As people get older or they're more Yes. Old. There's also a sensitivity against the environment. Like, you know, we won't be able to all go to Machu Picchu and, you know, to um, scuba dive the Great Barrier Reef. Those things are dying if we don't take care of them. So I think the fact that we can open up the world to more people and do these kinds of experiences. And you think about like Zoom, you know, if the, if the pandemic had happened 10 or 20 years prior, how limited we would have been in our ability to actually yeah. function and be productive and be connected. It would have been impossible, right? So now imagine 20 years into the future, what would it look like when we have even more immersive technologies and even more fluid connections and even more ability to be able to um, share our work. So yeah. and comfort working certainly remotely and in a more distributed way. I know it's so, I mean, there's so many, uh, you know, you, so many areas I can take these conversations with you because like you said, it's like, it's talking about, you know, the future, but I want to get back to data. I want to get back to data and, and I'd love to understand how data features in your work, but I'd, I'd love it from the perspective, you, you know, AI, you know, you're an AI, AI advisor. Talk, talk to me about that. And, data in general if you wanted to? Well, I think that, you know, data becomes, you know, whether, whatever analogy you want to use, the oil of the future or the such and such of the future, but I think it also becomes a big moat in terms of my company versus your company or my organization versus yours, because the more data that we collect and the more that we're able to understand it and use it in very thoughtful ways, um, the more insight that we will have, the more um, that we'll be able to create things that are relevant and personalized and um, integrated well into our lives. And so I think that they will be, you know, the thing that creates all the promise and will deliver us on the promise that we have around all these things that will be possible in the future. That said, it needs to be done responsibly and it needs to be done thoughtfully. And one of the things that we, sh we showcased on New Year's Day was AI Global, which is an organization that is, uh, its mission is to ensure safe and responsible use of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And they actually uh, are building toward a certification model. So at some point there will actually be certification for your AI um, algorithm and product. But in between now and then, and that's being done with a worldwide coalition that includes the World Economic Forum and IEEE, I mean IEEE and ISO uh, and others around the world. But what's also interesting right now is they have open sourced on their website at AIglobal.org, I think, um, a just what they call a digital assistant that just takes people through uh, any developers or engineers project managers, uh, a checklist of five domains or five areas in which we need to be really thoughtful in which we're building these databases and the harnessing of the insight around them. And so you can sort of self-assess where you are across those five areas. And then if you join AI Global, you can get some more insight around that. But I think it just, what we need to become is more literate around this. What does it really mean to ensure that we've got robust data that's not biased, 
and that the AI drift, you know, as the AI starts to learn more, that it doesn't start to drift in, a, right, in an area that we didn't want it to and make sure that it is on course to be able to give us the insights that we really need. And it's not just about autonomous vehicles and precision medicine. It's literally about background checks for people. It's about, you know, uh, who gets promoted and who doesn't inside huge like school systems. It's about parole. It's about, I mean, it will impact every area of our life. And so because data becomes so ubiquitous, it will be the thing that runs it. We've got to treat it with a tremendous amount of respect and integrity and thoughtfulness. And so you have a great book coming out by the time this podcast is released, Leadering the Ways Visionary Leaders Play Bigger on February 14th. Would love for you to tell us a little bit more about the book. Thanks, because it really does, it is an extension of this conversation we just had around data. It really is this idea that as we move into such a, a transformative future, if we bring old legacy thinking, we bring 20th century thinking into a 21st century world, A, we'll miss huge opportunities because we'll move too slowly. Uh, but more importantly, I think we'll be really dangerous, right? The 20th century world of business created tremendous opportunity and lifted a lot of people out of poverty, but it also ignored externalities that we are now having to deal with. And whether that's environmental, you know, instability or ecological cleanup that we have to deal with, whether that's, again, this inequality that exists so much in our economy right now, whether it's, you know, concerns about physical, mental, and emotional health that have been disregarded as a result of so many of the decisions that, quote unquote, capitalism um, was responsible for, which I don't think is true. I think capitalism is a tool and it's about how we decide to use it. So uh, I think there were just some decisions that were made in the 20th century that, um, both good and bad, that we don't want to carry necessarily over into the 21st. And so we have to think differently. So it's really a book about thinking differently, changing our mindset. And when you do it through the eyes, again, of the visionary, the people who are building the future, they just think differently. There's a way in which they play bigger. And it has to do, again, around curiosity and connection and contribution and uh, thinking about things from a much more audacious, purpose-driven place and using each other um, networks and resources in much more effective ways and really being clear about who we are internally as well as we hope we want to project externally. There's going to be um, increasing, um, I don't know what the word is, but uh, challenge to the way that we think as we build a more diverse teams, as we have AI question some of the decisions that we make, and whatever it is, and we have to learn how to be able to, to handle those situations with more, again, I keep using the word confidence, but um, with a set of, um, that we are so threatened by it right? That we can actually like be open to challenging conversations and learning with each other. So there's just a whole set of things that go from very uh, technologically savvy to very personal, but it is an invitation to, you know, really explore the visionary in each of us so that we can build a healthy, thriving, inclusive future for all. And it's really, I'll just add to that. Um, it's really a shift of leadership. So I would argue that again, leadership built the 20th century, and leadering really anticipates the needs of tomorrow in the 21st century. And so if leadership was a closed hierarchical dynamic, I mean, whole, sorry, closed hierarchical uh, static system that was very intentionally designed to you know, ignore and root out variability so that we could build consistently and uh, you know, quarter to quarter, year by year, um, and scale infinitely without regard again to externality, leadering is a verb. It shifts it from a noun to a verb that is more dynamic, inclusive, um, adaptive, and allows us to be in a space of constant innovation and experimentation in order to be able to um, deliver sustainable long-term value. So instead of the focus on short-term growth, we are now going to shift our focus to sustainable long-term value, which includes multi-generations, not just, you know, next quarter. That's great. Personally, I uh, have a master's in creative writing, and I've got a unfinished manuscript. Uh, so I personally love that you have finished a book and it's uh, coming out. It's one of my goals as well. So. I gotta say, man, it takes some fortitude. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, you know, and, uh, and a certain amount of, again, the hard part about writing a book in this day and age is you're writing a, start, a static artifact in such a dynamic world. So mm -hmm. the hard part is like, you know, is your thinking going to, you know, um, be solid enough as you continue to learn? Because I'm continuing to learn. We all have to continue to learn. And so uh, it's really been a bit of a tightrope of what do I think is an evergreen way of thinking. And it's really about a way of thinking that is about this is the exact right technology or this is the exact right application because that's all going to shift and change. But I do think if we can shift our brain to be more open to learning and collaborating and thinking about risk really differently, I think we've been stuck in a way of thinking about how to keep ourselves safe that is now actually the thing that's creating all the vulnerability. If we can shift those kinds of things, um, that it is fun to have a book that hopefully will be around for a while and be really useful for folks. 
And Nancy, what was kind of your writing philosophy? Did you set aside a certain amount of time every day? How did you kind of... Uh... You know what? I will say, I, 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 I've struggled, as you have, AJ, for many, many years. I've been asked to write a book for a long time. I could never really quite get off the dive. And so I ended up asking for help. I went to um, a company called Scribe that helps, you know, sets you up with a scribe, literally a coach. And we recorded interviews. And so we recorded... I don't know, 10 or 12 hours worth of interviews around all these things. Um, and then she helped us structure it. It was really structured very much online the way I gave my keynote talks. So that wasn't as hard, but there was a lot of decisions we had to make along the way and she helped sort of do it. So she did a rough draft and in fairness, it was completely wrong, <laughs> but it was really helpful to have that draft and to go in and rewrite it. And so once the, the, you know, you're in the process of it, then, um, and unfortunately I am not a disciplined, like let's do it for two hours every morning kind of gal. I just sort of set aside like X amount of weeks and just like for 14 hours a day, like that's all I thought about. And then I let it go. And, you know, then I took a pause when the pandemic hit, to be quite honest, because I really wanted to make sure that what we had written about was really, uh, I felt like everyone woke up. I'm like, gosh, now everybody knows all these things. You know, is it still relevant? And you're like, oh, <laughs> apparently we haven't fully gotten all the lessons yet. Uh, but we did I go back and do a whole another edit to make sure that it was um, seen through the eyes of this experience that we'd all been gone, had gone through together. So um, one of the best pieces of advice someone gave me, which is don't rush necessarily to someone else's deadline, you know, make sure that you literally are trusting your own instincts and it's as good as it can be um, when it's ready. And I actually had multiple outside editors take a look at it as well, just because there's a difference between the thinking being an A and the writing being an A. And I wanted those two things to be more in sync. I'd love to be a chapter in that book, AJ. Uh, maybe that's what you're waiting on. So uh, you know, I was happy to get you one. Here's the other thing. I think at some point you have to have a little mental health issue. It's, it's 73,000 words, which is a lot of words. Wow. What I finally decided is if there's, let's say, average 10 words to a sentence, that means there's 7,300 sentences. And here's the deal. Some of them are brilliant. Like, I can't believe that I wrote them. And many of them I will look at, you know, a month or two from now when this is really out and be like, holy crap, I can't believe we got a book out with that sentence. And hopefully the majority are in the middle and they're good enough. So that's, I think part of it is just giving yourself credit for it being smart and good enough. Yeah, I think, I think what you said just now, Nancy, is what happens is I set it aside for four months and come back to it. And there's just too many sentences that I want to change or think about, hey, what was I thinking? Why did I put that in there? I know. And I think that that's actually being responsible to the reader. So I think that that's actually <clears throat> lovely that you do that. You go back and don't think everything you wrote the first time was perfect and right. And that's, I think, again, this goes back to in the whole world right now, everything we're going to be doing is going to be iterative and it's going to be uh, a work in progress and getting more comfortable with that. Right. But at some point knowing that just like an MVP of, you know, a software idea <clears throat> is a, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know what happened. Uh, it's a good mindset for being able to uh, push out new products and new services. I think the same way with this is like knowing that you've given it your best and, you know, again, had two or three people vet it and then just let it go and let it find its voice. And, it's there. and then you'll fuck. I you know everyone's warned me already. You're going to work on the second one then because now you're like, Oh, I wish I'd said this. And, oh, this leads me to think that. And Oh gosh, the questions that I get podcasts like this are so smart. I want to go and answer that question as well. Nice. Sounds like a 2021 resolution, AJ. Get that, <laughs> uh, get that book going. Get yeah, it. Uh, too. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. Your motivation. Nancy, I want to get back on something that you touched upon. You talked about AI and you also talked about inclusion. I, you know, I want to, you know, ask you, is there a concern that as AI becomes larger in the future that minorities will get left behind as far as AI is concerned? Well, I think many of us will be left behind. Right now, AI is being developed by a very homogenous group of people. Um, basically, and I'm just going to say this with a certain amount of respect, because these are also people who are willing to boldly go to new territory that no one has gone to before, but it's white and often Indian men that are building AI. And so no matter who you are, you're going to have blind spots. You know, I could probably get all like Italian women and we would also have blind spots. And so uh, the thing is that we really need diverse teams that are in there building this work. And so as a result, we need everybody in there. We need women, we need people from different um, education disciplines, from different parts of the world, from different um, socioeconomic status, and then certainly from a you know, racial and ethnic background, as much diversity as we can have in it, because that's how you challenge some of the assumptions. That's how you're able to see around the corner. Uh, there's so many stories right now about facial recognition that has been built in a way that only recognizes, you know, a certain um, skin tone. And that's because it was built by people who only had that skin tone. And so unless we can figure out how to do that in a much more thoughtful way, we're going to continue running into these 
um, really hard walls. And right now they're small. Right now they're still like, oh gosh, we didn't realize that it would do that. But when those applications start to become more broad, and we're seeing again the power of exponential technology, when you see what's happening with social media, you can see how it's really important that we build this thing thoughtfully. So yes, I am very um, a big outspoken advocate for the fact that we need to have more diverse teams that are building this. And as a result, then we need more diverse cultures because you also don't want just everybody that comes from a different looking background to sit around the table and be expected to think the same way. We still need to make sure that people are able, again, to challenge each other's assumptions, to challenge each other's um, perspectives and ways of thinking and be in environments where that is okay and actually encouraged and that we feel like we've got the capacity to be able to manage that well. So it doesn't create all this animosity or, you know, fiefdoms or things that go underground or really we need things to be as open as possible. So we have to build culture um, inside our organizations that allows for that kind of diverse thinking and that kind of um, uh, collaborative building of stuff. So, you know, one of the projects that I did this past year was we built the Fem Futurist Society. And so uh, I'm not as regular, I think, as you are with this podcast. It's a lot of work, man. Um, but we have had at least 16, and I think we're moving on to having more interviews that like every, you know, once every week or two, I get to speak to a futurist around the world who is doing some extraordinary work. And she is often unrecognized or not sort of seen as much of um, the thought leader as uh, we would like for them to be, or just, just want their work to just be more visible. Even many of them actually are quite famous, but they still um, often do get quoted enough, right? When someone's giving a presentation or someone's thinking about the future. And so I do think it's important to have that conversation or that perspective in this work and in this conversation to balance it out. Because when you look at the statistics, man, it's not good. And the last thing I'll say on this, it's not even about building AI that's not biased. And it's not just about recognizing women so that we can have their perspective, but also when you look at who's going to benefit from the, um, the economic you know, productivity of these technologies, we wanna make sure that that is spread more equally. And it doesn't just go to a very, very small homogenous group of people because that would be very detrimental to our society. But Nancy, sounds like Vincent and I are safe at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I was, you know that's like the crazy first thought i was like oh geez a, yeah aj and i but there's so that's not you there should be more it shouldn't be just aj and i yeah that's like the first thing i thought of is like uh, you know it, yeah but anyway uh, yeah, but I, mean, yeah. I appreciate being on your podcast and i appreciate actually when i went through the list of who had been on in the past i love that you've had a varied group of people men and women and people from all different types of backgrounds like i think it's we fall into these ruts of like the people that we know and the kind of thinking that we're familiar with and i love that you've challenged that yeah this yeah we we try to i mean you know in the beginning what you do uh when you start any podcast is you you invite some of your friends and and your your clients on and then you hope someone listens and then you know fortunate for us um you know we started getting listeners and then you're able to you know, you know reach out to people and and and, and expand it and which is why we, we you know we came across you that's what we try to we just try to get interesting uh, people and topics on for our listeners. Uh, listeners will also let you know what they want to hear about and who is so it, it's uh, it's crazy. But Nancy, you talked about the some of the talks you did with futurists there. Also that event that you did on New Year's Eve. Uh, is the where could people find out about these events? You plan on doing more in 2021? Yeah, you know, again, I would describe myself as a strategic futurist and gatherer and now author. Uh, but the gatherer part is really important because I do think that when we get into community together and learn together, it really creates a different kind of alchemy. And so, I mean, I was one of the first TEDx organizers on the planet and created 10 TEDx events and then built these conferences with clients. So that's one of the things that Playmaking does is that we do help um, organizations and teams build really dynamic experiences and really think strategically about how we open up capacity for people who are attending these things because it's not just about like getting a badge and hearing a speaker like there's so many opportunities because really what I'm trying to do is turn people on to new information um, and so we have been doing now some of these things on our own if you go to nancygiordano.com it's a pretty good starting place it can take you then to play Big Inc., which is the business side of it. It can take you to Fem Future Society, which is the uh, conversation series that we're growing there. We actually also have built in the past something called the Career Fair for the Future for college and high school kids. I feel very strongly about the fact that um, our youth right now feel very threatened by the world in which they are being raised in and are very scared of that. And I want to make sure that they feel like there's a safe and thriving future that they have a very important part in. And so we have spent a lot of our time making sure that um, youth feel good about the future. So those are all the kinds of sort of the side projects to the keynote talks. And then there's some talks on there and podcast interviews. This will be there. Uh, we have a blog that we don't do as regularly, but when we've got something important to say, we 
put a piece out that's pretty thoughtful and gets a good response. So there's a lot there. Oops, I muted myself there. <laughs> Uh, Nancy, you started your career with ad agencies and you worked with some of the big ones um, and, and then kind of combining that with youth. Did you always know you wanted to get into advertising? And the second part of the question is we have a lot of kind of younger student types that listen to our podcast. What advice do you have uh, for them going into 2021 in a, for a career in advertising? Yeah, you know, and I think, again, advertising like anything else has shifted so dramatically. So it's not just a one sort of thing where you picture Mad Men anymore, right? There's such a data side piece to it. There's certainly an AI piece to it. There is um, an experience side to it. There's a virtual reality side to it. I mean, there's so much, I think, that is growing and expanding. And we start talking about advertising. And so I really think of it as outreach. You know, what is it that, uh, how would I want to contribute to that? One of my three children is in a program right now at University of Texas that's all about art and immersive technologies. So it can really be... A contributor to so this way of being able to expand content delivery and experience for people. So I do think being much more curious about the fact that these industries are going to shift and change, whether or not you're going you're interested in being a pharmacist or a doctor or a lawyer or even in construction, like none of those things are going to look the same in five or 10 years. So really being thoughtful about how technologies are going to change your industry, I think are critical. Um, for me, you know, it's funny, I grew up in the South, uh, in the 80s is when I graduated from college. And at the time it was like doctor, lawyer, engineer, banker, mom, you know, a teacher, like kind of were my options. And then someone introduced advertising to me like, oh my God, there's a whole thing called the creative arts. Like how, and creative in business. Like I don't have to be, you know, a songwriter, but I can be in the creative world. And when I went to my first ad agency job, there was literally not a single task they could give me that was too mundane. I was like in the most, I was in the world I was supposed to be in, around really bold, creative, conceptual thinkers who took information and turned it into, you know, um, some sort of idea that other people could get turned on by. Like, I still think that is as a driving force, a really exciting thing. So I think that the biggest advice I give kids is get really clear on your own curiosity. What is it that you are passionate about? And hopefully it has been baked out of you by everybody else from teachers to parents to coaches. Uh, but you can still get, you know, connect to your curiosity. Don't believe that everything that on the syllabus that you're learning is going to be complete enough. It's not. So really extend your own learning. Take online classes, talk to people, interview whoever's around you, read a lot, like really extend your own learning. You're responsible for your own education. It's not just going to come through the doorway of what somebody else thinks that it should be. Um, and think again about the technologies that are going to shift the area that you're most passionate about and learn more about those. I actually love it when uh, students reach out for an internship or a job directly to me. It's one of the few types of emails that I uh, respond to just because if somebody is taking that much initiative at that age, uh, we, we can probably find an internship for them. Yes, and I would say, and then say thank you because I have done these interviews and stuff with college groups and then there's no response back. They're super aggressive at getting in the door and then they are not thoughtful about saying thank you or being appreciative afterwards. And I think that is right. a, big uh, generational flaw that needs to be addressed says the mom on the podcast <laughs> but i really think it's important because if people are giving you that time right it's again it's, it's an exchange yeah. and so if i'm willing to give you this i would like to think that it mattered and that you are appreciative of it so i would like to teach that recipro reciprocity so so one related question the last one from my end i'm sure you get a lot of linkedin messages um and a lot of them are unsolicited or actually most of them are probably unsolicited. increasingly so <laughs> what, what's a message that uh, really gets a response back from you and what's one that really annoys you? I mean, the, the list of annoying is like growing by the day, really. And I actually had one again this morning that's like, I've tried to reach out to you three ways, you know, through email and through text and through LinkedIn and whatever. And you haven't responded. I'm like, because I don't have any. Take the hint, Bill. Uh, yeah. I mean, so <laughs> like, I find, and I'm, I've gotten better at being able to write the, you know, uh, pointed response back. Uh, um, and really, it's just, please remove me from your prospect list has become, you know, a, a multi-day email or LinkedIn message that I send to people. And, you know, I just think it's being respectful. I do think increasingly what I'm seeing is people who've actually gone to the page now or their bot has gone to the page and seen what it is that I'm actually working on. And so they try and reference that in the note, which is, you know, a step in the right direction, but unless they can see that there's really a relevant link, because the thing that bugs me the most is when people are trying to sell me services that I've got no interest in, like it has nothing to do with my business, but somehow you think that this is an important connection right now. So I think again, if they, people could get more empathetic and more insightful about why they were reaching out to me and why they thought that mattered and whether or not they scale it again through a bot, that's fine. But I just think that um, 
I just hate the ones that are so mismarked. I will say from an email, um, I got one that was a, you know, just a content email and I'm trying to remember it was like media ventures or someone during the pandemic. And it was just saying, how are you just checking in? And they wrote something really lovely about sort of emotional, um, well-being at that moment. And I was, I read it as I was walking, which is a terrible way to be reading your emails while you're out taking a power walk. Right. Um, but I was, and I started to like tear up. And this is where I go back to the very beginning of the conversation. What are the brands that have your back? What are the ones that are really there to support you? They weren't trying to sell me shit at that moment. They just wanted to like check in and make sure I was okay. And they wrote a really thoughtful thing that made me feel somehow seen and understood at a really challenging moment in the middle of this pandemic. So I do think empathy, leading with empathy would be the thing that I beg for. Um, and certainly, you know, take away the rude. Because I think we're going to become a more and more rude society as we just again described at the beginning of this podcast. We're going to have to figure out how to temper that down um, and become more respectful and kind and compassionate. Yeah. I, I, I like the empathy piece. I, I think in the beginning in 2020, when it, the pandemic was just beginning, you got a lot of, we're just reaching out to see how you are. And yeah, you didn't feel that it was genuine. Uh, how could we help? We're here to help. All right, well, I need a babysitter right now. I need this and that. But, but that message that you mentioned there, that seems more of like, well, here's a story. Here's some meditation advice that, you know, our employees do, that sort of thing. And I like the, I love the advice about the students and, and AJ and I are big fans. Uh, we found uh, one of our producers, one of our interns at an event. I'd also give this advice to students. If you reach out to the person, just don't reach out to them once. If, you know, maybe he or she is very busy, stay persistent. That's how we found our, um, you know, our Inter Persistent and thoughtful, though, because I will say there was and thoughtful. Yes, now, yes. And I kept saying no, no, no. And then finally, she proved to me that she was really she had the goods, and she became one of my favorite people ever. If Michelle Kafif ever listens to this, she she was an intern. She ended up working with us. I miss her every day, um, and we're looking for something like that now. So if there is somebody who really wants to, you know, be a part of helping us build and uh, produce stories around the future, we are looking for that now. Yeah. Um, That's I'm that's fine. great. So yeah, so listen to that. And lastly, uh, we just have a minute or so here, Nancy, for fun. What do you like to do? You're very busy, but you know, tell us about you know some favorite shows you do. You said power walks. What do you like to do for fun? Uh, yeah, power walks have definitely been my thing. And in summer, I was really like, I had a sunset ritual, man. The sunset and I became like connected, and I really would not schedule anything in that seven to seven thirty hour because it just sort of became my sort of place of focus. Um, and being able to, you know, gratitude is a big important part of how we need to live our lives right now. And so I would spend a lot of time being really grateful for the things that I have in my life and the fears that I don't have to contend with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but there are, there's always some like dark side that comes and grabs you, right? And so I would ask the sun to take it over the hill. Like I would just get in touch with whatever it was that was going on for me that day and just say, just take it over the horizon, like just take it away. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that felt very peaceful. So I think that I have become much more at home in my home and, uh, I am really, very, very grateful for it. And, uh, you know, I, I watched Bridgerton like everybody else did. Just, just finished it. Wow, what a show. Shonda <laughs> yeah, Rhimes. Totally. I just told AJ about it last night. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's for everyone, but I do have to say my daughter and I, and actually, you know, I am really blessed. I have a 17-year-old daughter who's home this year. This is supposed to be her last year. Like, I was not, not supposed to see her almost at all. And instead, we see each other every day, and we watch these shows together. And so I feel incredibly grateful that I get to spend this much time with my daughter. I feel really badly that so many of her rituals have been um, ripped away from her and so many of the things that she was told that she needed to plan for are now disintegrating as she goes to reach for them. So I think, again, compassion for this generation of kids that is having everything shifted around them is really, really important and being able to hug them tight. Like I feel yep. even more grateful for being yep. able to do that all the time. This has been great. Nancy, this has flown by. We really appreciate your time and, you know, advice. You've also given me advice, uh, you know, outside of the, the call there. I, I, I love it. I appreciate it. That is Nancy Giordano. Check her out, nancygiordano.com. Also the book, Leadering. The Ways Visionary Leaders Play Bigger comes out February 14th. This podcast will be right around that time. Go out, get it, go to Amazon, get it. And we really appreciate your time. That's Nancy Giordano. I'm Vincent Petrofessa. He's AJ Gupta. This has been The Marketing Stir. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks for listening to The Marketing Stir podcast by Starista. Please like, rate, and subscribe. If you're interested in being a guest on the podcast, email us at info at themarketingstir.com. Thanks for listening.